is iboga or what is ibogaine and we know it comes from the tabernacle the iboga tree and we know it's an alkaloid but most people don't know what alkaloids are so you can think of them like caffeine and uh, serotonin which is also a alkaloid so very common some safety stuff that we'll dive into today is just you know there's okay, understanding thanks, there's, con there's contraindicators for everything um the real one is anything that prolongs the qt interval of the heart you'll see it up here um the reason this happens is because ibogaine specifically binds to the uh the herg channel in the heart and that's what regulates the heartbeat and so large amounts of ibogaine um, can affect that channel the safety beautiful part about iboga is it's only eight percent ibogaine so in order to consume enough iboga to actually cause the cardiac risks to the heart, you would have to eat a ridiculous amount of iboga, like probably like 70, 80 grams, honestly, which is not possible. Um, so working with the wood is why Joe and I only serve pure root bark, because we know for a fact that it's got its own safety built into it. Um, other ones are mental health disorders, obviously pregnancy and Breastfeeding, unless you're Joe and you went to Africa and got initiated while five months pregnant. Uh, liver and kidney disease, of course. And then um, obviously SSRIs and other prescriptions. And again, this is just showing the difference between um, how similar Ibogaine is to something like caffeine or serotonin. It's all pretty much in the same family. Some fun facts. Um, you know, we know it's from the tree. We know there's over 12 different alkaloids, and we know about the Bwiti people. These are the indigenous peoples who um, are the bearers of this medicine. And we have our nonprofit Sacred Roots Foundation just to just to give back to them. So we give a portion of all of our proceeds back. And we have some cool fundraising stuff we're doing. So um, next, real quick, is um, Ibogaine. Um, what receptors does this thing bind to? Right. So people might know, for example, psilocybin binds to something called the 5-HT2A receptor? Well, uh, everything almost has one receptor it binds to, except for this specific molecule, which binds to a whole slurry of them. So we know it binds to the serotonin receptor system, which means it acts like an SSRI. In other words, it acts as an antidepressant, which stabilizes your mood. It binds to the opiate receptor system. This is what most people know about it from for its opiate addictions. It binds to the sigma receptor system. As, and what's interesting about the sigma receptor system is a uh, mutation in sigma-1 um, actually uh, causes cancer. And Iboga can fix the mutation in the protein. What happens is the protein folds a different way, and Ibogaine specifically can refold it the correct way. So it has anti-cancer properties. It works on the glutamate receptor system, which is just like ketamine. That's that disassociative quality. Uh, the acetylcholine receptors, if you anyone's ever been addicted to nicotine, it's one of the hardest things to break. Iboga binds to that receptor. The retreat we did last week, um, there was uh, two young kids, 19, who have been smoking nicotine for since they were 12. And um, it's only been seven days, but they've both been fully clean uh, since they've had it. Um, and the boy has had no withdrawals. <clears throat> Um, dopamine receptor system, obviously this is our reward system. And so it's also going to reset the dopamine system. So if you just think about this for a moment, there's not really anything you're going to find on the planet that binds to all these receptors. And we're just talking about Ibogaine. Remember, there are 12 different alkaloids that aren't as studied. Um, I can tell a story about tabernanthine later. And so I just want to fly through a Stanford study that was done recently because uh, this, just the results are through the roof. So what they did at this Stanford study is they took 30 veterans and what they did was they measured them before treatment for things like PTSD, depression, anxiety. They took an MRI and EEG on them, got the full diagnostic criteria of them. Then they treated them with Ibogaine, one session, and then they measured them after the study. And so what you're going to see here are the results. So the first thing to note is that... Um, PTSD, anxiety, and depression, all but eradicated, if you look here. This is the grays, the pre-treatment. Here's post-treatment for suicide, depression, anxiety, or PTSD, depression, anxiety. Um, another one, uh, suicidality, which is something that greatly affects the veteran population we have. It's very, very sad. 
Um, if you look at it here, it dropped down from right around 50% to below 10% within six months. And then moral injury is a, is a big hot topic now in the field. Um, it's where one held deeply, uh, deep beliefs and values that are betrayed or violated in high stakes situations. And so you can see moral injury also reduced greatly. Um, going to the brain imaging portion of it now, what you can find here is that the cortical thickness in different brain areas increased. And so what we're talking about is when your brain essentially shrinks and shrivers, um, you're less, uh, it's like a less healthy brain. It's a less functional system. And so what we're actually talking about with Iboga is you're literally growing your brain, which is nuts to even consider that one plant has a capacity to do this. And remember, this is just one treatment, right? And only with one of the alkaloids. We don't know the benefits of all the other alkaloids yet, which is it's coming right now. And obviously neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and schizophrenia, you're talking about a therapeutic option for those. Another interesting study is uh, in the same study, they also looked at the veteran population and looked at the different regions of their brain and said, hey, before the study, we looked at the regions that were normally dormant or lacking blood flow. And then after the study, let's look at the regions that had new amounts of blood flow. And if you look on this right, these are all the various regions of the brain that had increased blood flow. And if you think about what blood flow means, blood flow is where your prana goes. And so what you're talking about is this bringing aspects of the brain that were normally dormant back online. And so I imagine if you can just use a small percentage more of your brain every day, what that would equal in your life in terms of awareness, in terms of consciousness, in terms of memory retention. All of those things that we sort of gauge our life by, what yeah. our brain health is getting improved with Iboga. Joe, would you mind muting everybody if you can? Um, and so just two brain regions I want to talk about. Um, the white matter region down here, this is sort of like the communication system for your brain. So that increased. Obviously, memory formation came up. Uh, reward processing decision and, and the um, and social behavior, that's the left frontal orbital gyrus. Um, and then another one, motor control for the uh, middle cingulate gyrus. And so you're talking about very important qualities and factors of our life that are getting improved from Iboga. Um, if you want to look at this one here, this is just in terms of self-reported disability. You're showing that basically people's self-reported disabilities decreased um, through the study as well. And another one down here, there's different types of functioning um, that they measured, like cognition, mobility, self-care, getting along, life activities, participation. All these different categories also improved, adding to the overall quality of one's life. And one of the, the clearest parts to show from here is this one here is pretty cool. So cognitive inhibition, processing speed, and flexibility. These are basically measures of how our brain can move from task to task throughout our life, right? And cognitive inhibition is the ability to say no. If so we're battling a substance and someone's smoking next to us and we want to hit the cigarette, how can we just say no? It actually improved the cognitive inhibition. Um, the next one is probably my favorite of this whole entire thing. And what they did was before the study, they made a predicted brain age of all the veterans. And after the study, they did another predicted brain age of all the veterans. And on average, the brain age reduced prediction wise by 1.37 years, which means the brain actually got younger. And again, this is just one treatment with one alkaloid. Uh, and so what we're doing right now is working on research to try to get better understanding of what this whole cocktail does. Uh, we have a woman here at the retreat I'm running now and she had an MRI right before she came and she's gonna have another one when she goes. And so I'll be able to look at that data and we're doing this type of things. And in some time we're gonna have a presentation just like this that we'll submit and it'll basically be about Iboga itself as a whole. Cool. So uh, some of you may know, there's the microdose and there's the macrodose. Um, Joe likes the macrodose. So the small perception uh, subperceptual dosages are the microdoses. Um, that should be a subtle mood shift, maybe a little bit more creativity. Um, it's really great for daily interactions. You start in the morning and we'll show you a protocol later 
Um, and what you're doing with this is gradual long-term improvements, really. Um, or if you're someone who's post-addiction and you're looking for support after that like blissful state wears off from iboga as it starts to metabolize, um, that's another good way to use microdose. And a typical range is about 100 to 400 milligrams. Um, but you'll have to find your ceiling at some point by testing it and then start down from there. Just remember, microdose means you don't feel it, right? It's subperceptual. And then a macrodose, on the other hand, is um, you can think of it like when you come to an iboga ceremony um, or, you know, three grams or maybe a full gram for some people. But a macrodose is something you definitely feel. With those, you're going to want to have more space in the day. So if we tell people the macrodose, we're usually doing it on a Saturday or Sunday where they can be in nature all day. And what I will say is in Africa, if you were to go out there for initiations, the, the men, they take iboga before they go hunting. And they take macrodose amounts. And what they say is it makes them like the jungle cats. We have a pelt we wear called the musingi. It's a jungle cat. And they say it makes them like the cat. And they're walking through the jungle with their eyes wide. You can hear everything. And if you've ever had iboga on a macrodose day and you're out somewhere and you're in a big field, you'll see something like a little rabbit from far away move. It'll, your eyes will just catch it. It's, it's pretty fascinating. So there's definitely something to that. Um, and with the macrodosing, just make sure you're in the right place in your life for that, right? You don't want to just take that on when a lot of shit's kind of going because you might not be in the space to really hold that experience. And so it's really something that takes a lot more um, planning, right? Microdose is something you can wake up and do, but a macrodose is something you really want to take some intention and plan out. And we'll talk about that later. Um, some of the benefits, obviously, reduce stress. That's right. It binds to the SSRIs. Um, improve focus. We saw the brain results and emo emotional regulation. Of course, your brain is responsible for that. And so it's resetting the entire brain system is, in essence. Um, some benefits of the microdosing, like I said, they use it for hunting. Uh, it's also an aphrodisiac. And um, there's a faculty of awareness that expands within you. It's why, it's why we call Iboga a spiritual technology versus a plant medicine. It just feels something that's a little bit more true. It's a technology we can use. Um, maybe I had a double slide. My apologies. And so what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to switch real quick to um, our microdosing protocol so I can share with you guys exactly what that looks like. And then I'll drop it in the chat. Um, and then we'll have some question time. So, and excuse me if I'm speaking fast or slow. I um, We had a ceremony last night. I still haven't slept. So, uh, you know, the life goes in this work. <laughs> um, so, can everyone see the screen? I think so. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, so, our microdosing protocol that we offer to people um, is just a guideline. You can do it however you want, um, but this is just something that I've tried both of these myself, and I've had clients I work with who went through it, and I've refined it a little bit. So this is the one that I've found is very effective. Um, and so just a general, so you'll see there's two different protocols. Protocol A is a more spiritual approach, and protocol B is a more therapeutic approach, and I'll explain that in a second. And on this last page is some tips, like being barefoot, 45 minutes before you eat breakfast, all the little needs to knows that you might want an integration coach, all those things. Um, so I want to start with protocol A. And um, if any of you got to meet Maud, she was one of the elders who trained Joe and I. Um, there was a day before a ceremony where I was about to take the medicine and she said that, um, try something first. She said, I try to take the medicine without eating it. And so she had me hold the jar to my heart. And she had me imagine that on the inhalation, I was pulling air through the jar, through the wood into my heart and circulating it back out round and round and round and round and round. And I kid you not, after about five minutes, I felt the wood come on. And so that's what inspired me to make this uh, spiritual, a, the spiritual approach for the protocol. And if you'll see here, what you'll do is you'll find your ceiling. In this example, it's point four. So week one, three days a week, you'll do point four. Week two, three days a week, point three. Week three, we go down to point two. Week four, down to point one. Week five, six, seven, and eight, 
you ingest zero, but you go through the same exact process if you were ingesting. So you'll sit at your altar, you'll do your prayers, whatever it is you do. You'll sit, you'll be reverent with the medicine, you'll ingest it, but you're really not eating anything, right? And if you guys ever saw Joe Dispenza's work, he had this study where he had um, a group of people who went to the gym and did bicep curls, a group of people who didn't go to the gym and do bicep curls, and a group of people who sat at home and thought about doing bicep curls. The group who went to the gym, their grooves, muscle grew by like 30%, whatever the number was. The group who didn't go, like me, didn't grow <laughs> at all. And the middle group grew by like five or seven percent. And so the point is, is his 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 teaching, his wisdom there is that our mind is a very powerful thing. And so if you can teach it to grow muscle, you could probably teach it to not have to ingest iboga, but to sense it within you. Right? Because remember, all iboga is doing is it's it's bringing us closer to our truest self the true eternal version of you. That's what it's really doing the most. It's clearing the mind so that that self, that soul can shine through. And you can tap into that. And that's why I made this first uh, spiritual A or protocol A. And you can see here as the time off break, a four, six month break between 14 week cycles. So large breaks, right? We don't want to rely on anything to be happy in our lives. This is meant to be a tool to make us completely authentically empowered. And so we keep a larger break. You don't have to follow these, but these are just the ones we put out for you. Um, and I even have the total amount you would be needing if you took uh, 14 week cycles, about 4.8 grams. Yeah. Protocol B is more of a therapeutic approach. And if you see here, it's just consistent dosing. I have a range from 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. And you're basically doing that for two weeks on, one week off, two weeks on, one week off, two weeks on, one week off. And then you're taking yourself another large break if that's right for you in between. And then just some of the final tips. Um, yeah, just make sure it's a reverent ceremony, right? Like if you're just throwing it back and going, it's not going to have the same connection that if you're actually spending time with it. Have it on an altar, have it near something sacred to you, anything like that. Like if you saw Joe's altar, you'd think it's the cutest thing in the world. But it means something, right? Hers are, it's her intention and energy going there every day. And so I wanted to just open up now any questions about, um, I guess, the microdosing protocol or anything else I could answer you about microdosing right now.